one of them, the COO of the company, never went to college. But when he was a kid, he was taking apart his father's lawnmower and probably never put it back together and, uh, <laughs> and radios. And, and so, but skills are what it's all about. We need lifelong learning. Lifelong learning, because if you're not trained, if you're not skilled in this fast-moving world, you're going to get left behind. And I think that's very important. Now, some of the Democrats will tell you, liberals, not liberal Democrats, will tell you, well, what we need to do is to take from the people at the top and give the people at the bottom. Well, I don't think Robin Hood works, because what we don't want to do is to punish the successful. We just want to provide the incentive and the tools for people who are at the lower income level to be able to rise. And so the minimum wage, the reasonable minimum wage, is not going to throw people out of work or deny other people who have lower skills a job is something we've got to hit that sweet spot. But just imposing $15 or $16 in New York is going to have a lot of unintended consequences that are not necessarily going to be good for workers. Okay? Was there something else that you asked? Part of the discussion was about what should be the relationship between government and business. Well, look, I'm going to tell you our approach is um, we honor job creators. So we cut taxes. We balance our budget. So we're not sneaking up on anybody. I'm going to you know, jerk you around and, and cause you trouble. We have a group that looks at all silly regulation that government has. And we begin to eliminate the silly regulation. And we love small business. Small businesses in Ohio will pay no income tax, up to 250,000, which is almost all of them. And we killed the death tax, by the way, so that if you work a lifetime to make something, you can pass it on to your kids, which I think is really important. Now that we've killed the death tax, we're working on killing death, but we haven't figured that out yet. Um, but the relationship should be, it's the private sector that creates the jobs. And government should facilitate that. Now, I will tell you that if a business is outrageous in what they do, then we're not going to tolerate that. Let me tell you another thing that got me concerned. I read in the paper that we have an auto company in America that's thinking about locating an auto plant in Mexico to produce small cars to ship those cars back to our country. And they say it's because of NAFTA. I called the guy, the head guy. He said, what are, you, what are you doing? He said, well, we've invested a lot of money in America, which they have. They're a good company. But I said, if, if what we're doing is passing trade agreements where we move stuff out of America to ship things back into America that's made somewhere else, you're going to kill trade deals. I mean, we got to think about the American worker when we go through trade deals, because you're the one that can get ripped off. I mean, those are the people I grew up with. So there's another issue in there as it relates to wages, trade deals, and all those things. It's not simple. But the general approach should be limited government, workforce development, training, lifelong training. And those are the kinds of things that we can do. I'll give you another little secret. I talked to a guy who's running a big company in another state outside of Ohio. And uh, I'm not going to tell you who it is. I called him up and I said, look, I'm not here to tell, announce that I'm poaching somebody's jobs in another state. Uh, I'm not here to embarrass you. But if you're thinking about moving somewhere else, you ought to check out Ohio. Big company. You know what he told me? We're leaving here. They've treated us terribly. Our taxes are too high. We're disrespected. We're not told the truth. And we're thinking maybe we'll go to Ohio. It's not a company here, okay? But I want to tell you that when government runs rugged over our free enterprise system, now back to the auto company. The auto company has a right to do what they want. They want to make a profit. But there's this theologian, Catholic theologian by the name of Michael Novak, and he writes that a free enterprise system that is not underlaid by a set of values is bankrupt. So I think it's a... Right? It's like porridge. Not too hot, not too cold, right there in the middle. So there you go. I, he asked me what time it was, and I said, I told you how we made the watch. Yes, sir, back here. Thank you. William Campus of Local. My question, sir, is I live within range of a decommissioned nuclear plant. 
you hear me all right? I, I did. You live in, in a range of a decommissioned nuclear plant. Well, it's being de decommissioned. Yeah. My question is, the nuclear waste has been a problem for our country and our politicians. If you were elected president, would you reverse Obama's decision to close the Yucca Mountain Oh, no, I, I was in Nevada. I won, I won points when I didn't say Nevada when I was there, okay? <laughs> but I, I was in Nevada and they asked me about Yucca Mountain. I said, I think we have to store these wastes in Yucca Mountain. So that may be, I'm sure, real popular in Nevada. But, uh, you know, so I, I just think you've got to take care of these nuclear wastes. You just can't sit around in these pools. And, um, you know, you can always look at improving technology or whatever, but I, I don't think we should go backwards. And when I was budget chairman, that was actually in our budget. Yes, sir. You've already heard that we do have an active pop radio in the area. And this morning when you got that compliment, uh, I choked on my coffee because the lady, that, the lady that gave you that compliment parks her room to get on the air. <laughs> And you already told us your experience in calling it in on my show. We can make sure that a lot more people get your message tomorrow morning. Okay, why don't we try to do it on Monday? Because they're probably not on on Saturday. But, uh, I'm only weekend. Hey, look, hey, let me tell you something, sir. In politics today, if somebody gives you a compliment, you don't kick them in the teeth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, this is why it was so unexpected. I mean, you're really right. Uh, my, my, my question. Are you, you a talk radio way? show host yourself? Yes. Oh, you are? Yes. What a voice, huh? How's he do? <laughs> why didn't you invite me on? <laughs> I'm invited. I am. Right now, liver. You are invited. My, my question, make it all the way to Commander-in-Chief. For anyone in the military, active reserve guard, who so chooses and is qualified, should they not also be allowed as civilians to carry a personal firearm? Well, yeah, I think they do. We're, we're for con even concealed carry in Ohio, of course. Let me tell you another thing, uh, a couple things about the military. To me, it is just unbelievable that they come home, they're the most qualified, drug-free, great leaders, and they can't get a job. I mean, it, it's ridiculous. And you know what we do in Ohio? If you drive a truck from Kabul to Kandahar, we will let you drive a, a truck from Columbus to Cleveland without having to go get a license and trained and all this stuff. So, we, are moving, we are moving to say your experience in the military should automatically get you credits and licenses without having to go through the hassle. And I'm glad we're doing it. You know, one of the challenges we have is when somebody from the services are coming home, many times they want to have a breather. And so we, you lose contact with them. But what we need is the Pentagon to alert the families and the people in the service that these are the jobs that are available, tell us what your skills are, and we will try to connect them. Okay, that's what we need to do. Uh, because, you know, everybody wants to hire a veteran, because a veteran's like ready-made, right? Ready-made for work. So that's another thing we need to do. And, of course, the VA is a whole other subject. Uh, Bob McDonald, who ran Procter & Gamble, is trying to run the VA. It's such a big operation. Uh, we're going to have to get experts in there to figure out how to, you know, we may have to decentralize the whole thing. It's probably expanded vouchers so, certain, so veterans can get health care quickly. Uh, it's something we have to work through and think about in a more business-like way so our veterans can get the, the help they need. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Wait a minute. How do you feel the scandal involving Planned Parenthood should be addressed? Well, I mean, we, we have put, in our state, we put Planned Parenthood all the way at the bottom of getting any money, and some aren't getting it. And in Washington, they're talking about cutting it off. But I like what they're saying. They're saying family planning is fine. We'll just move the money out of that organization. To me, it seems like a very good solution. Yes, sir, right here. I'd like your opinion on the Iranian situation. Uh, well, I mean, look, the, the, the Iran uh, agreement is a terrible agreement. And I mean, everybody's saying it. But let me tell you what the reason why I think it's a bad one. First of all, they're ultimately going to, it's all predicated on the fact that if we're nice to them, they'll be nice to us. I mean, what kind of thinking is that? <laughs> secondly, secondly, they're going to get a lot of cash that they can use to fund people who want to destroy our friends and frankly want to destroy us. Hamas, Hezbollah, I mean, they, 
Hezbollah blew up the barracks over there in Beirut, killed our soldiers, our, our Marines. I mean, to give them all that money makes them such a bigger power, and it's just the opposite of what we need. The other thing that I was just praying that the Senate will reject this, and let me tell you, the key in this are not the Republicans. The key in this are the Democrats who will have a vote on whether they want to override the president. Is there, that thing is going to be defeated, the president's going to veto it. In 1983, I voted against President Reagan against the deployment of Marines in Lebanon. I didn't think they should be there in the middle of the Civil War. I was one of about 14 Republicans that voted that way. It's not easy to vote against the president, okay? But it, I felt it was right, the right thing to do. Now. These Democrats, it's why I think sometimes we've got to be careful about trashing people in another party. I'm just hoping that they will say, keep the sanctions on, we're not doing this until we see a fundamental change in the behavior of Iran. And in the meantime, you would think that we would get all the parties to these talks to agree that if there is one inch of cheating, We'll slap all the sanctions back on and expand the sanctions. I don't think they're even going to try to get that. It's such a big, terrible agreement. And I don't say that because I'm a Republican. I'm saying it because I'm worried about the proliferation of these weapons. I'm worried about this nuclear material falling into the hands of some of these people who would just as soon put it in a suitcase and blow it up in the harbor in New York. This is a very bad agreement. This is serious about our country. and. Um, Let's see what happens. I hope it will be rejected. If it's not, we better watch it. Watch it all the way. And one element of cheating or anything that threatens our security or the security of our allies, it's a whole new ball game. So that's kind of how I feel about it, sir. And I think they fell in love with getting an agreement. You ever fall in love with buying a new car? It's much different. But when you fall in love with it, you end up paying a, a lot more than you should. And that's what happened on this agreement. Okay, way in the back. I don't want you to jump. Yeah. I voted Republican since Nixon. I did that absentee from Southeast Asia, so give me an idea. You did what? You said what? I voted for Nixon, absentee from Southeast Asia. Okay, good. Give you an idea where I stand. But I would like to see the border below us, a big fence put up. Yeah. A real big fence yeah. behind one. And two, anything comes up, Put a tariff on it. Mexico is not our friend. They backstabbed us, backstabbed us, and backstabbed us so many times. It isn't funny. And as far as these people saying, oh, there are all these people up here. Well, I, I rode the road behind two vehicles. They were driven by people from probably up there. They made enough smoke to hide an aircraft carrier. So there's your greenhouse effect right there. You know? All right, let me I talk about it. Something about that fence yes. go up. Okay, let me all the way. Across. Yeah. Okay, let me talk about that because and I'm gonna just give you the clear my clear feeling about the whole thing. Let's first of all, sir, there's a former congressman who John Senator Sununu knows, named Duncan Hunter, who built a fence over by San Diego. And Duncan has told me that they have stopped the border illegal border crossings like almost totally. And they stopped the drug trade. He also told me that he wanted to finish the fence and that there were interest groups that didn't want to finish the fence. Some people kind of like the fact that people can get across. And I'm not talking about just liberals. So we need to fix the fence. We don't, you know, whether it's a fence, whether it's drones, whether it's sensors, it has to be done. Now, we got 12 million, 11 and a half million people living here. If they have, if they are not criminals, if they're not breaking the law, if they, if they are, they got to go to jail or be deported. If they're living here, then they're going to have to pay a fine, in my opinion, and uh, they're going to have to register. We have to know who they are, and it's a, it'd be a longer path to legalization. They could get legalization, in my opinion. It's impractical to think about deporting them, and I don't even want to, because they're a part of the fabric of our culture now. We need a guest worker program so people can quarterly come in and out and work and go home and earn money for their families. Now, I think that's good as well. But here's the other thing. Once we reach an agreement, nobody else gets in. You come in, we're sending you back. No more, everybody needs to understand. We reach total agreement. 
that once it's done, no more excuses. We're not letting you in until you come in in an orderly way. And by the way, if somebody in the businesses hire you, we're going to fine you. We're going to hold you accountable for the fact that you're making out here in some way. So that's that's kind of what I would do, sir. And um, now let me just comment about Mexico. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's like the Wild West. I mean, you've got drug lords. You've got but look, Mexico's got great potential. They got young people. They've got natural resources. Uh, I don't believe they're our enemy. I think they could be. I mean, we want them to get up on their feet. So people have to tell you something. I saw a lady the other day came to see me. She said, I came here legally. I said, why did you do it? She said, because my kids weren't safe, and I just wanted to be in America because I know what America is about. Now, when I see that, what, am I supposed to be angry at this woman? There's no way I'm going to be angry at that woman. So, you know, that's kind of how I feel about it, and that's the way it goes. So, uh, all right, right here, sir. Governor, we have at least three forms of federal health insurance. We've got Medicare, we've got Medicaid, we've got the VA, and we've got Obamacare. What can be done to, what's your position on reform? Well, let's we'll take Medicaid, okay? Medicaid, we have it in our state, and the, the Medicaid growth in my state has gone from 9% when I came in to where it's growing at less than 4%. Nobody's not taken off the rolls and nobody's benefits have been cut. We're managing the program. And one of the things that we did is we said if mom and dad can stay in their own home rather than being uh, denied the ability to stay in their own home and be shipped off to a nursing home, we're not going to do that. We're going to let mom and dad stay in their own home. And um, so we've made a lot of changes in that. Now, I think Medicaid over time needs to be sent back here because every state has unique health care issues for the poor. And so I think each state should write their plan. Now, i got to tell you, you can't take Medicaid money and pay highways with it. Because politicians will do that if they're not held accountable, okay? They will do that to solve a problem, but that money is there for a purpose, and, but, but fashion your own plan. Because we have a one-size-fits-all mentality, which is, you know, everybody's a, 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 a size nine shoe. Well, everybody isn't, and that's why you need to shift these programs. Medicare is going to need to be, that needs to be strengthened. We can't run out of Medicare, and there's a lot of reforms that we can, that we can look at, including allowing people to move into Medicare caring with what they, kind of insurance they had when they were working. I mean, it's a thing to think about. In terms of Obamacare, the problem with Obamacare, well, there's a lot of problems, but it doesn't deal with costs. Now, I'll tell you what we're doing and what I think we could do in the country, again, with some guardrails. And I'm going to give you a perfect example, because health care is complicated, isn't it? It's, it's complicated, and sometimes it's scary. We have a children's hospital in Columbus and they are working with an insurance company. If you, have a, if you have a child who has asthma, it has been normal practice that that child would go into the hospital, be hospitalized to, to get in, in good health, okay? Well, what we've done is we've reached an agreement, or they have, I haven't been in the middle of it, but I'm encouraging them, they can keep the child out of the hospital and the child remains healthy. So guess what happens? The hospital gets less money because they don't have as many visits. The insurance company has more profits because they're not paying claims, right? So guess what we're doing? They're sharing the benefits of kids staying healthy and not being hospitalized. You see, our, our healthcare system rewards quantity and not quality. You go to the hospital, you only need two tests, they give you 10. Nobody cares because somebody else is paying. Of course, we're all paying in the end. So we need to have a system that literally works to keep us healthy. So our, our provider, our, our base doctor, could be a shepherd to move us through the system. Our primary care doctor can be incentivized to make sure we get good quality, but at the same time, we don't need excessive medical care that drives up the costs. And we're, we are unleashing this in the state, and I think it can be unleashed across the country. So what do we end up with? Better quality at lower prices. And you might say, how is that possible? Well, if we let the market work, that's what will happen. And we will not sacrifice quality for costs. We can do both. And I've been able to show it in, in what we have done with, uh, uh, with Medicaid in Ohio. And I would get rid of Obamacare. 
I just wouldn't have it because I don't. It's not effective. It's driving up health care costs. The very thing we want people to have insurance, we drive up the cost 